What is going on, I Do Podcast listeners? Welcome to the show. If this is your first time listening, it's a new year. Maybe you have some New Year's resolutions to work on your relationship. Thank you so much for joining us. We interview the world's leading relationship, marriage, dating, therapists, couples, people in the field to help you improve your relationship. So if you're struggling in your relationship or you just want to make it better, we're here to help give you the tools to succeed. And we are really excited for 2018. 2017 was kind of a revamp of the podcast. We had started the podcast almost four years ago, just before we got married. And then we had our, I was going to say, we had we a got, break. I was going to say, we got <laughs> pregnant. I hate when people say we got pregnant because I didn't get pregnant. Sarah got pregnant. Well, we got married first. But we got married. And then we had a baby. And then. Sarah had a baby. <laughs> I, had I was a baby. just standing there. <laughs> but and so yeah, I got kind of sidetracked and then the downloads kept kept improving and more and more of you were messaging us like, "Hey, when are new episodes coming out?" So last year, we made a commitment like, "Hey, we need to give the people what they want," right? <laughs> so we started putting out uh, actually two shows a week for a while and now we're back to one show a week uh kind of for our own sanity. Two it's was a, a lot. It's a little more sustainable with a 2-year-old running around just to do one show. Yeah. So <laughs> so so yeah, and so 2017 was a was a great year for for us and for the podcast because we really committed to uh at that point it was one show a week and just it became basically a full-time job for Sarah and uh, I was doing other things but still helping but Sarah was just like hey let's make this happen and uh it's happening like we had our first sponsors of the show supporters which really helps us to be able to you know pay audio people and pay editing and website and and Sarah for her time and and a babysitter to watch Stella when we do the interviews so so anyways it's kind of long-winded but just give you a little backstory and now here coming into the new year after a full 2017 podcast continuing to grow it just feels like uh like now we're just running on all cylinders and it's just continuing to to improve and we're continuing to get great information and uh, it's just been awesome to hear from you guys so we're really excited about this here yeah it's it's i've shared this before i think on social media but last year it was just amazing for me and and for us in the podcast but it's really doing the podcast it is a job but it doesn't feel like one so i think it's just to me i'm so thankful to be able to do something that i love and to be able to give you guys tools um us give you tools to help your relationship so i feel super thankful to be able to do something that we both enjoy that doesn't feel like a job and that is helping you guys so and we want to thank you us. for listening yeah and helping us yeah yeah it's been great so here is to an amazing 2018 and <laughs> to kick off the year we've mentioned it on the podcast before but we have a couples retreat that's going to go down here in Co Costa Rica, where we are currently living uh, for six months of the year. And we are really looking forward to that, where basically we will be doing new and exciting things every day right alongside with you, uh, horseback riding, surf lessons, uh, couples therapy exercises, daily hikes. Um, Zip lines, snorkeling, yeah. yoga, massage. <laughs> oh, massage. <laughs> I like on. that one. <laughs> yeah, because in the idea is to kick off 2018 with a renewed vigor for your relationship and for each other because trying new things and and doing adventurous stuff together as we know if you listen to this show so many therapists recommend it it's a way to keep things fun and exciting and uh just interesting in your relationship and the holidays have passed so we're we're past getting presents for each other for the holidays but Valentine's Day is coming up. So if you are looking for an awesome present for your partner for Valentine's Day, this is a great opportunity. And it's just a couple of days or a couple of weeks past Valentine's Day. So it'll be a great gift for your loved one. Yeah. So check it out. Uh, Sarah, why don't you tell them where to find more information? If you go to our website, idopodcast.com, up at the top, you'll see a tab for retreats. You click on that. It'll take you right to the 
Costa Rica Couples Retreat, and we'll also have a link on the podcast description for you as well. Perfect. And let's just jump right in on today's episode. We talk about infidelity with Robert Weiss and specifically how to tackle it from, not from a male's perspective, but it obviously it's different depending on who has done the cheating and, uh, and healing the relationship. And Robert really zeroes in on the male side, but this is important for female and male listeners to hear, but how men can do all the wrong things after, you know, committing infidelity, but then to try to heal it. And uh, we tend to not have the right approach. So he talks about how to do it. And one thing, although Chase and I don't struggle with infidelity, maybe you're listening to this and, and you're not struggling with infidelity, but there are still a lot of great tools in this episode for you. And one of those that I feel like I related to with Chase is that a lot of the times men try to fix the situation instead of just listening and, and being there for your partner. So I think that's one tool that men and women can take away from this episode too, is if there's something that your partner's talking about, maybe don't try to fix it right away. Just listen and be there for your partner. Sometimes that alone can just be very helpful for the relationship. Yeah. Men tend to, you know, in the context of infidelity, you are, you've committed, uh, you've cheated and then you're just trying to fix, fix, fix. And the reality is that you need to regain trust. You need to foster healing and, and then you can fix a relationship. So, uh, but like Sarah said, it doesn't even have to be infidelity. And I'll give an example. It's kind of the other side from, from a female perspective. And often I am the one trying to fix things. But the other day we have this uh, coffee percolator and it is making watery coffee right now. <laughs> it's brand new too. We don't yeah. quite, we haven't figured out why Anyways, it's not working. <laughs> yeah. If any coffee percolator experts out there, but, um, so I, I, I had made a comment like, ah, oh, the, the, the coffee is watery again. And Sarah's like, did you line up the grinds in the water? Which is, they have numbers and it's very like <laughs> clear. Like I would have to be an idiot not to do that. But that's, you know, that's a form, of, that's a communication thing. But anyways, I was more just venting, you know, I, I didn't need Sarah to fix the issue where she's like, oh, did you try this, do this. And oftentimes it is the guy doing that. And, and this isn't a knock on Sarah. It's just an example. And I probably could have communicated better and said something like, man, I lined up the coffee grinds and the water and it still didn't work. And then Sarah would have, you know, maybe said, not said that and tried to fix it. But regardless, it was an example of someone in a relationship just venting, which we often do, and then just wanting to be heard. Like, I don't want Sarah to fix it. I just want, I want empathy and compassion, essentially, and be like, yeah, damn, that watery coffee sucks. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then we can both, both uh, be together in that, uh, in that moment, empathizing with each other. So, so it's a funny example, but, it, but it's true. Like it kind of, we didn't get in a fight over it, but it kind of became a, a point to, to talk through. And that's why I'm bringing it up here. And funny enough, this conversation was going on as Chase's mother, who is also a therapist was sitting at the table with us. So it was kind of interesting to be walked through the conversation with her and kind of it, I think it opened my eyes to the conversation and chases and we kind of came to a, um, I don't know, a, a resolution that worked for both of us, which was pretty cool. Yeah. And, and in the end, the point is not trying to fix everything, <laughs> just listening to your partner and then positive reinforcement. Like I just wanted Sarah to be like, yeah, that <laughs> damn watery coffee, you know, I didn't, I didn't need it to be fixed, no. but these are all first world problems <laughs> here that we're dealing with. So definitely keeping that in context, yes. but, but, uh, it is valuable and, and you'll learn a lot of these things with our interview today with, uh, Robert. So we hope you guys enjoy the episode. Thanks so much for listening. And as always send us any podcast episode suggestions or any comments that you have and we love to hear from you guys. Enjoy. Hi. 
Hi, Rob. Thanks for joining us on the show today. Oh, I'm so I'm truly excited to be here. Lots to talk about. We've given our listeners a little overview, told them about your work in helping people in their relationships. So why don't you tell us why you enjoy doing that so much? Why I enjoy working with unfaithful couples and men who have cheated and uh, sexual addiction in general. Is that your question? Or just couples in general. Yeah, just helping them um, improve their relationships. Well, I think one of the... I've been in the field of sex porn relationship addiction for almost 30 years. So much of what I've written about has been um, sort of the far end of the infidelity uh, spectrum where I work with people who've, you know, had many, many partners and been acting out, acting out sexually for many, many years until their spouse, male or female, becomes aware of it. And so, you know, because I've been in this field, because I have been sort of at the sort of leading edge of internet related infidelity and digital infidelity and all of those things and been writing about them for a long time, it occurred to me that um, really every unfaithful couple has a lot in common. And I, over, you know, li- literally 30 years of doing this work, have seen hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of unfaithful couples because that's the work I do. And what I see is a pretty consistent pattern of what gets them stuck when they're trying to heal. And I wanted to write a book about what I thought men weren't doing right when they wanted to get in there and heal a relationship where they had been engaged in infidelity. And I just felt like men didn't get it, that men don't understand what women go through when they are cheated on and betrayed. And I also kind of a little bit think women are a little too easy on guys in terms of letting us get away with it. So I wrote a book on women's empowerment where I wanted men to understand what women go through when they're cheated on and and what they can do to fix a relationship because they just don't really get it. Yeah, there's certainly a lot of things to unpack here. And let's start with talking about of all these couples that you're seeing, it is pretty unique that, you know, this one person having interactions with hundreds of couples who have been cheated on, um, where there's infidelity in their relationship. Is there a common theme that is leading, um, a partner to stray? Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think people stray for all kinds of reasons. Um, and in fact, there's a lot, I mean, that's not really fully my area of expertise, but I'll tell you that there's a lot of, a lot of literature out there right now. I know Esther Perel has a Ted talk and she's been writing, she's an expert in, Couples in Fidelity, Helen Fisher, who is an expert in anthropological issues related to human human development and sexual relations. You know, these folks who are really looking at the biological and uh, and our histories, you know, really have a very different view of fidelity than we do in our value system, our religious system. You know, we're just um, apparently who we are as human beings doesn't fully match up with our values and beliefs and how we choose to live. And that conflict um, creates problems. Yeah. And, and obviously it's, it's a broad spectrum of reasons, but I just didn't know if there was one glaring, uh, glaring thing that, that was sticking out. Well, I'll tell you what, I'll, I'll give you this. If you're a man, there is always uh, the single reason that the single ba- most basic reason that men cheat opportunity <laughs> and uh, I was in Vegas and nobody's around. I was traveling on a business trip. I, you know, just happened to go down the street and pass this big bigger place. I was online and found this app. Um, men seem to be more likely to cheat out of opportunity. Women tend to cheat in general because they are, well, we would have said in the past they weren't happy with their relationships. But if you read the cover of The Atlantic this month, uh, Esther Perel clearly says, you know, that about 20% of women cheat when they are very happy in a relationship and feel that their husband or male spouse meets all their needs. So clearly women cheat for a variety of reasons that go beyond simple, um, not feeling their spouse is there for them. Um, and this is new information to us. Uh, part of what she's saying, by the way, is that women tend to cheat more uh, because they no one could possibly meet their needs considering the amount of pressure that women are under today. And uh, and there's a lot of discussion also in the literature about, you know, what is marriage? What, you know, it used to be a, uh, kind of uh, um, financial and property arrangement to make sure children were protected. Then it became about love. And now it's supposed to be that one person is everything to us. And life isn't really like that. You know, we can't get everything from one person. We need a community and a variety of people around us to support us. So I do think people cheat when they feel, when they finally realize like, wow, I, 
everything is right in this relationship, but I'm still feeling unfulfilled. And uh, that isn't necessarily a partner's responsibility. So, but, but you wanted me to talk about out of the doghouse, I think a little bit about the book and what, what made me write about infidelity. What are the patterns that I see that are useful in couples healing? And, you know, I'm glad to talk about any of that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. It's just, it's interesting. And, and yeah, we could do several podcasts on, uh, the oh, reasons people yeah. cheat and, and, <laughs> and, and, and all of that, uh, you know, for sure. And it is interesting how the definition of marriage is changing and, and how that in, in our bio, biologic history from an anthropological standpoint may not fit into modern day uh, relationships. So yeah, we'll dive into that in a future episode. But yeah, why don't you tell us? So we want to obviously shore up our relationships and make sure that we are meeting our partner's needs. And like you said, one partner may not be able to meet everything, but it's certainly if you're not talking and communicating, um, like uh, doing a lot of the things that we talk about on the show with a lot of our guests, that is going to create the uh, system in which a partner might feel like they want to stray. So let's say... Uh, maybe. M- maybe, right. It's not, m- not maybe, for Maybe, sure. because we're now discovering that people cheat who are perfectly happy in relationships right. and really love their spouse, both, both male and female. That's, so we may have to re- readdress our assumptions about what makes someone cheat because I think today their interest in cheating, the reasons they cheat, what drives them to cheat and what it means to them is very different than it was 30 years ago. So that to me, that's just a shocker that there are happy people. I mean, not a shocker, but that people are happy in a relationship and then they still choose to cheat. So what women women. are happy in their relationships and they choose to cheat and they're happy with their kids and they're happy with their husband. They're happy with their life and they're happy with their work and they choose to cheat. And it has nothing to do with, for some women, a level of happiness. Um, But I will say again, I wrote a book about men who cheat on women and trying to help men find and negotiate their way back into a healthy relationship. So, you know, would love to talk a little bit about, a bit about what I see men do wrong yeah, when let's they hear try it. to fix a relationship where they have been unfaithful. Yeah, let's hear um, it. Because I, that's sort of the challenge that I want to address in Out of the Doghouse. Um, you know, you know us guys, we like to fix things. Um, you come to us and you say, male or female, and you say, oh, I got this problem, and boy, are we going to try and find an answer. Um, women tend to be more curious, more empathic, more, you know, well, tell me more about that. Whereas men are more about, let's find the answer. So I was really curious why men do such a bad job in trying to fix their relationships when they've cheated. You know, a man goes to Vegas and he gets a lap dan- a, a dance or he chats up an old girlfriend and has sex with her or something like that. And he's thinking, well, as long as my spouse doesn't find out, it doesn't really matter. It didn't mean anything to me. And indeed, it might mean nothing to him. Uh, It might have been just a casual hookup that really had very little meaning to him. But if he goes home and he tells his female spouse or she finds out, she is not at all going to think it was nothing. She's going to say stuff like, I thought you loved me. I thought you cared about me. What about our relationship? What about our world together? What about our children? Because women see things much more holistically than men do. So where a man may be thinking, well, she finds out I'm going to do flowers and candy and really be sweet to her and apologize, apologize. Uh, and then three months later, he's pissed because she's still angry at him about cheating. And he's thinking, look, it's been three months. What's the big deal? Well, to him, not such a big deal. To her, a huge deal. So I wanted men to understand this concept of betrayal trauma, of, of how a committed, engaged, loving woman is affected when the man she is deeply involved with cheats. And most men don't understand the depth of what she's going through, and therefore, they can't fix the problem. Um, because, you know, as I said, we like to fix problems, but I think men often underestimate the size of the problem they've created when they cheat. So what would you tell our male listeners who may be listening to this and say, hey, I don't understand why my wife hasn't forgiven me. What would you tell them to stop fixing it and try to make it better? Well, I... I First of all, I'd be shocked if there were many male listeners who didn't have a woman standing next to them because men often don't have much interest in listening or reading about these kinds of issues. It's 90% of women buy all self-help books. So I'm assuming that it's probably a woman who's listening to this who's going to you know, throw this at her man mm-hmm. <laughs> or a woman who's demanded that her guy sit and listen to this. I mean, that sounds more likely. <laughs> um, but what I would say to a guy is that, um, number one, um, don't apologize until you fully understand what you've done. 
Um, do you understand that to you, this may have been a casual experience to her. It means life, home and everything. And what you have done is you've broken trust. And I think that's the part that men don't get. And it's curious to me. Um, most men that I work with who have cheated would never take money out of their business fraudulently would never, uh, engage in a business contract where they would work for two people at the same time and lie to them. You know, most men that I work with are fairly committed to their integrity and their name when it comes to, let's say the work world. And yet they see some hot somebody somewhere in some situation and they go for it, not understanding that their commitment to their word and who they are as men is just as meaningful in their intimate relationship as it is in business. And that woman you're involved with, once she finds out you've cheated, will never look at you in the same way. Your relationship will never be the same, ever. It might get better. It might get worse. But it will never be the same. She will never look at you again thinking that you are a man who would never let her down, who would always have her back, and would be the last person to hurt her because you have done all of those things. And she'll never look at you in the same way again. And the wound takes a really long time to heal. I want to talk about the steps um to that healing. But first, I'm, I'm, it is interesting how this ties in um, to things you were saying in the beginning of the interview. But like you said, uh, these guys that you're working with have integrity like of the highest standard when it comes to business uh, contracts and stuff like that. But then infidelity is looked at kind of this different thing. And to me, when I hear that, and we talked about it earlier, like how marriage is evolving. And then from an anthropological perspective of that monogamy may not have been how our ancestors evolved. And so that, that might explain why this person who in, in other aspects of their life and they seem to be a have a very high integrity in that there's a biological basis for their infidelity. Well, is that, let let is me that jump something? in there because I, I, I think there's a biological basis for the desire to cheat. I don't think there's any biological biological basis for lying. Right. So what I'm trying to talk to men about is if you want to cheat, if you want to have sex with someone outside your marriage or your committed relationship to a woman, I have no problem with that as a therapist. It's, I'm not a moralist. I'm not a religious person in that way. It's none of my business. My thing is just go tell your wife, <laughs> like say, hey, honey, I'm going to Vegas. I plan on getting a lap dance. I hope that's OK with you. And as long as she knows about it and she says it's OK, then you can go do it. But this idea that a man can just say, oh, well, it's just sex. And so I don't need to let my spouse know about it, and I will live a lie, basically, in order to get away with this, is how six-year-olds act. And so in my defining infidelity for men in relationship, I had to think about, well, how do I look at this? Like, do I say, well, you know, well, I'm a therapist, so I don't want to say someone has some kind of, like, weird pathology just because they cheated. And I had to think about a name for it, and I realized that the right name for cheating on a committed relationship is, is uh, immaturity. It's the six-year-old who goes to the cookie jar and says, oh, I don't care if mom says, no, I'm going to have some cookies anyway. And then I just will tell her no when she asks me. Um, adult, you know, adults say, mom, I'm going to take a couple of cookies. Hope that's okay with you. And if mom says no, they say, oh, okay, well, we'll just have them after dinner. And that's that. So uh, while, there, while there may be a biological imperative to spread your seed, so to speak, and, and I do believe that men are very different in terms of how we think about sex than women, for sure, and all of the research says, shows that, that, that there is no difference in us in terms of our ability to tell the truth, to have integrity, to have our word mean something. That's what I'm interested in. I could care less whether a couple chooses to have an open relationship. That's up to them. But what I do care about is that the relationship has integrity, honesty, and trust. And that has nothing to do with whether you have an affair or not. It has everything to do with whether your spouse knows. Yeah, that, that's a great point. Yeah, and an interesting way to to dissect it. And yeah, because it, it's like, well, what is cheating? If and and what is your definition of? I I'd monogamy? like to answer that question because <laughs> yeah, yeah. I've been working on this for a long time. And uh, in out of the doghouse and in many other a bunch of my other writing, I define cheating as the keeping of profound secrets in an intimate relationship. So I could cheat on you financially, I could cheat on you sexually, I could cheat on you romantic, a whole bunch of ways. 
if I am engaging in some activity that would absolutely affect you if you knew, and I choose not to tell you so that I can go ahead and do it anyway, that's called cheating. (laughs) And it doesn't matter whether it's sexual or financial or whatever. It's the idea that I am going to go and do whatever I want. I'm going to break the connection I have with my spouse because they wouldn't necessarily agree with what I'm going to go do. And I'm going to go do it anyway and try to get away with it. And that to me is cheating. Yeah, that makes sense. And and it just seems like if you are getting to a point in a relationship where you're doing that in, in any of those fields, then you're not uh, keeping up the maintenance, so to say. You're not communicating with your spouse on on a level that is a mature adult relationship and and it's just easier to say you know what I don't feel like talking to my wife about my feelings for uh this ex-girlfriend and 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 then you end up talking to that ex-girlfriend and and cheating on your wife whereas maybe a better situation is to say sit down with your wife and be like, Hey, you know, this is, I'm, I'm having these feelings for so-and-so and just really being an adult. But it's funny because the easier way out, well, what seems easier is to just cheat or, or to just not lie about it. Right. Or to lie or not even cheat, but just not communicate. Yeah. It's easier to go into a store and, uh, you know, it's easier to go to a bank and try to rob, a, you know, walk out of there with a million dollars than it is try to earn a million dollars. But that's what I mean. It's right. <laughs> just because it's easier. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's what we say on the show a lot is like, it's not easy having a great relationship. Like it, it may come easier to, to certain couples depending on a lot of things, but even Sarah and I, you know, here we are, we have a relationship podcast, by no means are we experts, but we get a lot of great advice and we try to implement it and we do and it helps us, but we still get stuck and and have areas where, that we need to improve. So it's like this constant um, process. So what would you tell someone listening that's like, oh man, I, I feel like my spouse, uh, this sounds like us, like we're not communicating or maybe what steps can they take to, to sort of shore up their, their relationship so they're not going down this uh, negative road? Well, again, I, I, I tend to see people when they've already gone down it. Right. So, you know, and people go down that road for a whole bunch of different reasons. Um, not just one. So I think I can more speak to, you know, what to do to make it better. Um, yeah, yeah. But I will say this, you know, we do live in a culture that, and uh, I, I love saying this because I really believe it and it gets people all stirred up, um, which I love, but um, that means they're going to be talking. Um, I think we live in a culture where women don't fully want to understand who men are, you know, and men are very invested in letting women believe that we understand your needs and what you want. And you don't want us to cheat and you want candy and flowers and Valentine's day. And you want uh, happy mother's day cards and you want vacations and you want us to be attentive and engaged with kids. And we know what women want. I mean, you've told us that forever, but do you really want to know who men are? You know, do women really want to know that most men don't have an sort of innate feeling of emotional fidelity. It's something that is more a thought than a feeling for most men because we're different. And so, you know, a woman looks at a hot guy on the street who's a married woman looks at a hot guy on the street and she tends to say, wow, he's got a great butt. I wonder if that sweater would fit my husband, but, or look good on him. Men don't do that. Men think I want to get with her. I want to talk to her. I want to chat with her. Let me stand a little closer. Oh, look at that. Boy, she really is hot. Hey, dude, did you see that? And then I think to myself, oh, that's right. I'm married. I can't do those things. Very, very different. People, men and women are different. This doesn't mean that we can't coexist, but it does mean that we would be better coexisting if we were more honest with each other and especially around sex. So if you ask me what couples can do to improve their lives, I think they could start in part by being more honest about sex. You know, it fascinates me that we, when people have marriage counseling before they get married, people, you know, the marriage counselors ask them what they think are the important questions. You know, do you both want to have kids? You know, do you both want to work? You know, what is your, how do you see yourself living together? All the, no one says, I don't think, have you cheated in your past relationships? And do you think you might cheat in this one? And if you do, what will you do? But we know that infidelity is one of the top three reasons couples break up in this country. Yet when we're bringing them together, we don't encourage them or ask them to talk about one of the major issues that breaks up couples. And, uh, you know, we're all kind of in this collective, let's not talk about it place. 
Uh, I think the Harvey Weinstein story is another example. Um, what we're seeing, what I'm seeing right now, and I wrote about this this week in the Psychology Today, was I see this Me Too, hashtag Me Too thing happening, which I think is fabulous. You know, women are coming out and saying, I wasn't treated well, and this is why, and this is how. And we have thousands and thousands and thousands of women coming out and saying this. And then we have all these men pointing fingers at people like Harvey Weinstein and Bill Cosby and saying, oh, well, they're the ones. Well, that's like the sound of one hand clapping. Where are the hashtag me too imperfect men or hashtag imperfect men? Where are the men in this country standing up and saying, yeah, you know, there was a time when I kind of hit on a woman in a way that didn't make her feel comfortable or I was drunk at a work party and I hit on a secretary or, you know, I pushed this woman one day, I encouraged her. I mean, every man in America has most likely in some way at one point or another done something that made a woman a little uncomfortable. Why aren't we owning that? Um, that would be a conversation about these issues, not just the victims calling out their pain and all of us saying, oh, that's terrible. So I'm looking for men to stand up and be more real, more honest. And I'm looking for women to be more open to understanding men as we see the world, who we are, and maybe to begin to have more realistic expectations of some of our relationship values. Yeah, there's a lot, a lot in there. And, and, but the premise that, uh, we live in a very sex negative culture and and that being the seems like the the overlying theme here that even talking about the fact that men and women are different and that we look at a lot of things differently but around sex in relationships um is what what can lead to infidelity and a lot of these problems and it is interesting uh that it's even in premarital counseling it, it may not be a subject that's discussed um as much as it should we, be we, right? we don't we don't talk about sex in our culture i mean right. uh, you you have to understand i'm someone who has helped set up and run and manage and overseen uh treatment centers both addiction and mental health for the last 20 years 25 years i understand what the assessments or the questions that we ask people when they come into mental health or addiction counseling uh, you know, we do these little assessments where we have to figure out what's going on with them from day one. And so when co- someone comes into treatment or even to a therapy office, you know, we ask them about exercise and school and their kids and social activities. We ask the client about uh, work and um, eating and, you know, everything on the planet to try to figure out what's going on with them. But there is nothing in the psychological or standard addiction assessment where that would ask us to ask questions about masturbation or ask questions about cheating or ask questions about how's your sex life going. And I don't see the difference between asking about your eating habits or your sexual habits because it's just part of being human. And if we don't look at the whole person, all of it, then we're not really going to get to the bottom of what needs to be gotten to no matter what the issue presenting issue is. So yeah, we don't talk about sex in this culture. We don't want to talk about sex in this culture. And unfortunately, I'm they're going to keep prodding and while I'm on the planet to say, hey, folks, um, this is one of the major issues that causes us so many problems in our relationships and in our culture. Maybe we'd be better off talking about it. What questions would you recommend our listeners ask their spouse or their partner to start this conversation and open up honestly about sex in their relationship? I think any couple can sit down and say, whether they've been together a week or 25 years and say, hi, uh, so when was the last time we had sex? How was it? How was it for you? How was it for me? Are you enjoying our sex life? Um, You know, is there something we need to do more of? Is there something I need to do more of? How do you feel about being with other people? How do I feel about that? Do I ever think you might be? Do you ever think I might be? Um, I think that's a great place to start. Are we enjoying our sexual life together? Um, Doesn't, have any threatening tones to it. It doesn't mean anything bad has happened. It's simply, you know, I mean, I have to say when I, every few years in my life, I look at my, I don't know, electronic equipment and I think, what isn't working so well? You know, what's been upgrade? Oh, there's new, uh, there's new wireless equipment. If I don't get it, I'm going to be really slowed down on the internet. Every once in a while, I reevaluate most areas of my life, whether it's a car or a house or a product or a, yet we don't reevaluate our sexuality in our relationships. We just cruise along like whatever vows and commitments we made on day one, absolutely, probably likely stand on day 10,000, even though we've never discussed it. Yeah. It's funny. 
Um, but again, I want to I want to say something in relation to fidelity because out of the doghouse is written for men who cheat. And as I said, men who cheat often don't know how to find their way back to committed relationship, to forgiveness, to peace with that partner. And um, oftentimes they will go in with flowers and candy or they will go in with, you know, let me take you on vacation, show how much I love you or that person didn't mean anything to me. It's really you who means something to me. And none of that works. <laughs> None of that works. And then we get to, well, it's been three months. When are you going to get off my back? I mean, I've done that really doesn't work. So what I got curious about is what really does work when a man wants to heal his broken trust with a woman he's cheated on. And there are things that a man can do to make it better. And there are things a man can do to make it worse. And please share. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I mean, if you've cheated on someone, I think the first thing to do is you know, and they're aware of it is to validate their reality. Yes, I did do this to you. Yes, it does hurt you. Yes, it does hurt us. Um, What meaning, and then to be honest about what meaning it had, you know, it was really just something casual, regardless of how it made you feel for me, it was casual, or maybe it was something more meaningful, in which case that's a whole different conversation for the couple to have. And then how does it get, part of how it gets healed is time. It takes a good year, in my experience, for a woman who is deeply committed to a male partner and who has been cheated on to get back to a point where she feels safe, comfortable, and is enjoying the relationship. Men expect within a couple of months that you're going to be over it. (laughs) Women tend to want to know where we are after we've cheated on them. They want to look at our cell phone numbers. They want to track our history. They want to look through our bank statements. They want to, and we look at them and say, what's wrong with them? (laughs) As if they had some reason to trust us. They don't. Part of the challenge when one person has been unfaithful in a coupleship, especially a male, is that, you know, we think, well, but I've been honest with you in every other way. I mean, I've been a good dad. I bring, you know, home the groceries. I help around the house. Whatever it is that my job is in the relationship, I've always shown up and been trustworthy. It's just this little thing I did with this other woman that was a lie. And, of course, your wife or, or, or female spouse will look at you and say, I'm sorry, but a liar is a liar. And if you lied to me about that, then I don't know, you could be lying to me about a lot of other things. And that's where relationships break down, really. It isn't so much just about the cheating. It's about the fact that a spouse, a female spouse, spouse thinks that you are someone who would not deliberately go out and do something to hurt me. And then when you find out that this man did deliberately go out and do something to hurt you, it's going to be a long time before trust is restored. And not just in the area of sex and relationship, but She's looking at me saying, hey, I don't think I trust anything that's coming out of your mouth. There are many women who I have worked with who have been cheated on who will say to their male partner, I don't trust anything you've ever said to me. I don't trust whether what we're doing right now is real. And I don't know if we'll ever be on a stable footing again after what you did. And he's thinking, well, but all I did was get a blowjob, a lap dance in Vegas. And she's thinking, you ruined my life. And this is what the doghouse is for. This is when a man needs to stand up and say, you know what? I have done something to harm my relationship by cheating, and I am no longer an equal in this relationship for a little while. I need to actually come on, come home on time. I need to check in with my spouse. I need to do whatever it takes to make her feel that she can trust me again. She wants to look at my cell phone numbers, fine. She can look through my cell phone bills. She wants to go through my account. All of it's fine. She wants to GPS track me on my phone, Fine. If that's what it takes to restore trust after I have broken it, I am willing to do whatever it takes because I want to be with this woman and clear this crap up. What men do badly is they defend themselves. It wasn't really, didn't really mean anything to me. They give gifts that don't mean anything. They ask for forgiveness when someone has barely even processed what's happened to them. And in general, men, I think, are a little impatient with women when we have hurt them and we want them to stop being mad at us. Um, And this is what being in the doghouse is about. It's about learning to be patient and understand the harm you've caused a woman when you cheat on her. Yeah, it really, it sounds like just doing whatever it takes, whatever their spouse needs to make it right, no matter what it is. Well, you would, I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously I, I, you have to protect yourself. I wouldn't say that your spouse gets to hit you or your spouse gets to, you know, start, you know, take all your money and all your mutual money and go to Vegas. You know I mean? But within the confines of what is acceptable, what, what happens in your relationship? Yeah. You're not going to have that happy smiling face when you get home from work for a long time. And you know, she's not going to call you and say, Hey, let's go have some fun for a long time. 
And, and I think that men get frustrated. And well, again, I think going back to what we talked about earlier, you know, men like to fix problems. If you tell me I've cheated on my spouse and I need to fix that problem, I will go in to, to fix the problem I think I've created, which is a minor to moderately small problem. Because after all, it didn't mean that much to me, honest. But that's not how the woman in the relationship is looking at it. And men, unfortunately, sometimes miss how deeply wounded their partner is. Because to them, it was just a big, not a big deal. I just met her for 15 minutes. I don't know her last name, never meet her again. You're the one, you know, I'm spending my life with you. So why would you jump to some conclusion that I'm so unhappy in this relationship? With her? Because that's where she's at. And he doesn't have to know why or try to convince her that it really didn't mean anything because she's feeling what she's feeling, which is hurting, mistrustful, and betrayed. And really, he has to stick with that for a while. And that's not a pleasant reality for someone who's hurt someone they love. Who wants to be, who wants to be the bad guy? You know, and yet if you don't own that bad guyness and live in it for a while, the doghouse, your spouse is not going to come to trust you again. It's so hard to earn trust in, in the first place. And then when you break it, yeah, I just can't imagine. I I can imagine someone not wanting to grant it back easily because I particularly like in business, if someone or just friends, like if someone lies to me, even yeah. if it's kind of trivial, it's like, man, like. I just don't look at that person the same and I don't really want to be friends with them or associate with them because I just don't have time for that. Cause if you're not good for your word, then it's like, what are you good for? So, um, yeah, but if you are, now you sound like most of the women I treat <laughs> who <laughs> yeah, say that I mean... to their husbands and male spouses. And he's like, well, but, but, but I've always been faithful. It was just this one little thing. And you know, it's not my whole word. It's just this little piece of my word. And you know, like that. Yeah, it doesn't work. No, no. And and so what would you say if if it seems like if the guy cheats and then the the to our female listeners out there right now or it could be vice versa, um, but that they're not willing to step up to the plate. Maybe they're not cheating again, but they're not really taking this initiative. No, we don't want to do that. That's a lot of work. We just want this all to go away and get better. We don't actually want to have to change who we are and, and acknowledge the profound changes that are going to happen in our relationship for a year or longer just because I did this one little thing that took 15 minutes. Like, that's right. not fair, says the guy. But it doesn't matter because that's what she's feeling. And if he wants to earn his way back, he has to acknowledge, yeah, I did something crap. Look, the reason I wrote a book called Out of the Doghouse is because I have dogs. And when I have a young dog and they pee on the floor in the house, they go outside because they've hurt our house, they've dirtied our house. You know, if that dog pees on the floor, they don't get their nice candy and treats. They don't get to lie on the couch, even though they're not supposed to. You know, they're outside in the doghouse because they need to learn a lesson that it's not okay to dirty your home and then expect that everything's going to be fine. And I don't think it's really that different a lesson for any man who's cheated. You know, when you have brought this situation into your home, you are now responsible for it. You may not like it. You may not that want that to be the fact, but that's what you've created. And, and my job is to say to you, hey, dude, if you want to be with this woman, if you want to heal this with this woman, then you have work to do and it's not going to be fun and you're not going to enjoy it. And it's not going to be necessarily how you would like this to heal, but she's the one who's hurting. So it's your job to make this better. And I find men very uncomfortable with that concept. Another thing not to do that men do all the time. And it's just, this is really awful. I think is blame the victim. Well, honey, you know, if you hadn't gained that weight and after we had the kids and if you just gave me some attention and if we were being sexual like we used to, well, then I wouldn't have done this. As if, and let me say this for every person who's listening to your podcast, um, any person who's been cheated on, male or female, no matter what they've done, gained weight, been unavailable, had kids, lost a job, been depressed, whatever it is, nothing you can do in a marriage or commit a relationship can make the other person cheat. Um, you know, when you're in an unhappy relationship, or you're unhappy with your relationship, you can do a lot of things. You can get a divorce. You can join a recreation. You can join a softball team. <laughs> you know, you can play more with your kids. You can take up a hobby. You can go to counseling. There are a lot of things you can do other than what a lot of men in particular I, I run into seem to think, which is, oh, my relationship is not particularly where I want it to be, so I'll just go cheat. And then we have Ashley Madison and apps like that who say, hey, life is short, have an affair. And they're giving us the message that when your spouse is not available for sex, when you have three kids and she's busy with all of that and you're busy with all of that and don't leave your marriage, just go out and cheat. I mean, we're getting a lot of messages like that from the culture. 
And if that's what men choose to do, I don't think it's a problem as long as they let their spouse know first. Yeah. When you are saying these examples of the men saying, oh, it's not a big deal or they're blaming, I really feel like a lot of these men are emotionally immature in a sense. And they really not only do they need to own up to their, you know, what they've done, but it seems like they need some like self help awareness too to kind of grow and and realize you got to get your shit together. You know, like you don't act that way and you don't say those things. Well, this is why I wrote this book because I I wrote out of the doghouse because I have been working with men who cheat for 25 years, women too. But um, more often it's men who come to my office trying to heal a relationship that they have screwed up and they, but but they come in and they're frustrated. Like, well, I've just tried to be patient. I've tried to be nice. I've tried to deal with their anger. I'm fed up. It's like, well, but have you actually let her have her anger for a little while? Have you actually been in the doghouse, been the bad guy, and let yourself own that for a while? Because that would be the thing that would help her begin to grow um, past this, both of you. Um, yeah. Um, and in general, I, I, you know, I just put this out here there. I think women in general, and I push for this a lot, need to do more work in standing up to men. <laughs> I, I hate to be an ardent feminine, feminist here. I would say I'm a post-feminist feminist, but do women really think that men are going to give up any of their power control because women complain about it? Do you really think you're going to get equal rights or equal pay or any of that because you're annoyed about it? I mean, women are going to have to start marching in the streets and standing up to get men to move because men are not going to give up an inch until you guys push us to. And in my opinion, women have been far too easy on men for far too long. Um, And here we are with this very patriarchal culture right now with a very win, lose, right, wrong, kind of way of looking at the world as opposed to more feminine values of, you know, compassion, consensus, community building Uh, on every level. Women are not getting uh, who they are validated in our culture. And I think we see that reflected back in them complaining about sexual harassment, in them marching in the streets and beginning to say, ah, this is not okay with me. The last thing I want to talk about before we go to the lasting love round is what you would tell someone who it's been cheated on and their partner is not stepping up to the plate and and not doing these things. They're not cheating again, but they're just not taking the initiative. It seems like obviously counseling, but at what point do you say like, all right, we're done? Well, again, I, I, I don't mean to push a book, but this is why I wrote this book. I think the first thing a woman can do is buy out of the doghouse, take a look at it and say, okay, right. This book gives me permission to stay with my anger and it's, pushes him to do some things to grow. I'm going to throw this at him. And if he reads this and he still doesn't have some feeling of what I'm going through or what it takes to heal, then I'm not sure how well this is going to work out over time. But you have to understand that, um, in, at least in my world, it's very difficult for most women to leave a man over cheating because the reality is, is that, um, you know, unless you're a woman who can afford a divorce lawyer, who can defo- afford custody and counseling, who can afford to live separately than your, from your male spouse with kids and all that, you just got to put up with it. I mean, it's not like many, many, most women in our culture don't have a choice. It's only really the women who can af- financially afford to say, if you keep doing this, I'm done. Uh, who can do that? But if you're a woman whose combined income with your spouse is $70,000 and you have three kids at home, it's very difficult to say, well, he, I'm just going to kick him out. It may even be difficult to say we're going to go to counseling or anything because that may not be affordable. So women are at a great disadvantage in a sense. Um, just bringing this up and demanding that they are treated with respect if they have a family they're trying to hold together. Yeah, that's a reality that that's unfortunate, but but it is a reality. And it uh, definitely check out the book in, if you are finding yourself in this situation. But I would like to say, listen to our past podcast and avoid avoid <laughs> coming to a situation where one partner is cheating. Certainly, but um, we want to avoid that. But if you if you do end up in that place, you also need to have the tools, um, and you've given us a lot of great ones. So, Rob, let's go on uh, to the lasting love round. Today's show is brought to you by the book Lovelands. 
Love Lands, which is written by a past guest on our show in psychologist Dr. Deborah Campbell, is an easy to read guide to creating the relationship in life you most deeply desire. If you've ever wondered why you keep struggling with love and want to make lasting change for the better, Love Lands will show you how to make that change, not just in your relationship, but in every area of your life. I'm deep in the middle of the book right now, and it's eye-opening. Deborah's wisdom from her own love mistakes, as well as her client struggles, has helped me examine myself and has allowed me to become even more aware of the reasons I get defensive or have poor communication or continue unhelpful patterns. Deborah really just tackles what's at the core of diverse relationship problems and simply tells us what helps and what doesn't. Lovelands is available in hardcover on Amazon and audible.com. Visit idopodcast.com forward slash Lovelands to buy your copy today. That's idopodcast.com forward slash Lovelands. Today's episode is also brought to you by Audible. Get a free audiobook download and a 30 day free trial at audibletrial.com forward slash idopodcast. There are over 180,000 titles to choose from, including our recommended book, Love Lands, by psychotherapist and previous guest on our show, Dr. Deborah Campbell. Chase and I are both in the middle of reading the book, and it's pretty amazing. To download your free audiobook today, go to audibletrial.com forward slash I do podcast. Again, that's audibletrial.com forward slash I do podcast to get your free audiobook of Lovelands. What is one tool or practice our listeners can uh, use on a daily basis to help improve their relationship? They can take uh, any couple's relationship will be improved by taking five minutes a day with a timer on your phone and each partner sending, sending just two and a half minutes talking about what's going on with them and their partner saying, okay, this is what I hear going on with you. And then the other person doing that in 10 minutes a day, if you can just really, really listen to your spouse about where they're at, whatever they have to say, and don't comment on it, don't give them feedback, don't give them advice, just let them know you hear them and, and deeply understand what they're going through that day, whether it's problems with the dishwasher or my boss hit on me, um, you're going to have a better relationship. And as you go along and you start to talk on a regular basis, deeper and deeper things are going to come out. It's like you said earlier, uh, don't try to fix it like a lot of men do, but just try and listen. The, the, yeah, you're not going to fix it. You're just going to make it worse. Um, you can, however, say, I, and here's what I would suggest any man is cheated to say is, you know, I can only imagine how much I've hurt you. Um, I'm sure this is going to be with you for a long time. I know it's going to be a while before you can trust me again. Those are the things that will bring you back your partner, not when are you going to go off my back, and it wasn't that big a deal, and you know what, she didn't mean anything to me, is only going to make things worse. Is there a book or resource you could recommend for listeners who want to improve their relationship? Um, that's a great question. I would just say that it really, you know, I, I think couples have so much on their plate these days, so, so much, um, that I, I would recommend considering, maybe it's not even a book, but read some of what, uh, read the cover of The Atlantic, see what Esther Perel is saying about human sexuality today. Learn what people are saying about, I hate to say this, quote unquote, the new monogamy. Um, because people are, you know, we are not living in 1984. People are getting information about constant information about how to have sex with strangers, how to hook up with a sex worker, how to look at hours and hours of porn in ways that can be covered up and no one would ever know about. So I do think couples are exposed to a lot of stressors around fidelity that they didn't have in the past, not in the same way. And maybe they could talk more about that. Like I've been tempted. Have you been tempted? How's that going? stuff like that. Great. Well, those, uh, those resources as well as your books will be on your show notes page at idopodcast.com. We've been married for almost three years now. Is there any advice you'd give newlyweds? Um, boy, that's, a, that's, a, I would suggest it depends on what they want advice about. Um, I think the most important thing to tell newlyweds is that the feeling of this person being the most important person in the world and your everything is going to fade. Um, that romance in the way that it's written about in books and country music songs and all of that and poetry is not what long-term love and commitment is. And that, you know, long-term commitment is not being hot for your partner. 
uh, long-term intimacy is not seeing them and thinking they're the best thing is sliced bread. Long-term intimacy comes about as we get to know each other over time and accept each other's and learn about each other's and embrace each other's challenges. So the best thing I think I could say to any young couple is um, while the the exciting sex and the can't wait to see them at the end of the day and they're my best friend, I want to talk about everything with them all the time, is going to fade because that's just a part of the biological process of mating. It doesn't mean that your love has faded. It may, in fact, mean that your love is about to grow. What advice would you give our single listeners looking for a happy relationship? Well, you're going to have to go online. Um, if, you know, the, the days of meeting someone at the church picnic or someone uh, related to work are pretty much over. Um, just as a curiosity, um, I've interviewed a whole bunch of young women under the age of 30. And I can tell you that there are thousands and thousands and thousands of women in this country and men too, who under 30, who've never dated, not, not using an app. So one of the things I would say is that your world does, your, your dating world lies online. Um, I would say, you know, it's great to establish a baseline feeling that you might enjoy someone, but I wouldn't pursue a long-term commitment until I've actually met someone in person because that's the way it goes. We are different in person and, and genuine long-term relationships end up happening in person. And if you start getting caught away with someone's words and their profile and their images and the things they have to chat about, and you don't really get to know them at least a little in person, you may get a little too far ahead of yourself and end up, end up disappointed when you actually meet. Um, because there is, and I'm not being one of those like pro anti-tech people. Um, I think a lot can be developed, a lot of relationship connection be developed online, but at a certain point, I certainly, by the time you start to feel feelings for this person, you really want to go meet them and spend some time in person. Seems pretty logical, but in today's day and age, it is actually a really great piece of advice. And you can, you're scrolling through their Instagram feed, you're looking at all these pictures. Well, you're only seeing a digital best version of that person. So meaning, oh, yeah. yeah, it's, it's great. And it sounds common sense, but it, it's really important. Well, if you ever want to know where the looking good families of the 1950s and 60s have gone, the ones that where everything's perfect and our kids are all at the prom and our marriage is wonderful and everything is just as, a, you know, beaver cleaver wonderful, go on Facebook because every family looks happy. Every set of kids is graduating school. Everybody's going to the prom ever, you know, and then I talk to friends who put their lives up on Facebook and they call me they're like, oh my God, my life is such a wreck. I'm like, but it looks so good on Facebook. Like, I know my kids are failing out of school. My husband's doing drugs. Like, but I don't see that on Facebook, you know. So we, you're right. You know, we do put our best face forward online and you can find out every detail of what someone has said online. And that's really not going to tell you who they are in real life. Absolutely. Well, Rob, thank you so much for all of the great advice today. So why don't we finish by having... Can I, can I offer you one more piece? Uh, please. Yeah. So this just came more. up for me as we're talking. Yeah. I think it's really one of the major changes I've seen occur in dating and relationships since I was a young man, is that when I w and I'm in my 50s, so when I was young, when someone hit 55, 60, 65, and their spouse had died or left them, uh, they just stopped. You know, that, they were done with dating, they were done with sex, they were done. And today I have friends in their 70s who are meeting people online, going on dates, being sexual, and having new relationships. And I just really encourage um, those folks over 45 and 50 to not back away from the opportunities to meet people that are available online because you can know you can have a lot more safety in going out and having coffee with someone that you've met online than you did than we did back in the day going to a bar meeting strangers um so there is an opportunity for a second life and a third life and a fourth life no matter how old you are as long as you're willing to go out and look for it well, that is awesome advice, and, and hopefully all of our listeners out there who are in their 40, 50s and 60s and maybe 80s. we got 80-year-old <laughs> listeners, I'm sure. I don't know. I mean, <laughs> that would be pretty cool. But yeah, we encourage them to do that and, and continue that. That's such great advice. Absolutely. Well, uh, let's, let's have you tell our listeners where they can find you online. Well, I have a website that is by, uh, has my name on it. It's robertweissmsw.com. Um, you can also find me on Amazon. I have an author page, um, and, uh, at Rob Weiss, MSW on Twitter at Rob Weiss, MSW on Facebook. Um, you'll often see me, I blog regularly for the psychology today and the Huffington Post. So when topical issues come out around sex and relationships and intimacy, like the Weinstein case and other things, you'll see me out there talking uh, and advocating for healing. 
Awesome, Rob. Well, we appreciate it. And all of our listeners can find the information today's episode on idopodcast.com. And thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, thank you so much. It is a pleasure. Let's do more, okay, in the future. Lots of to talk about around sex and tech and addiction. I'm, I'm ready. Let's do more. Let's do it. <laughs> That's okay. a wrap. Thanks for your time. We hope you guys enjoy today's show. If you want to check out the show notes or the interview links from today's show, head on over to our website at idopodcast.com. Click on the podcast tab and you'll see this interview up at the top, followed by all of our other past interviews. And while you're on our website, check out our 14 day happy couple challenge. We send you a daily email with doable challenges to help strengthen and make your relationship even better. And on our website, we also have a bunch of free resources in the form of downloadable guides and workbooks. Um, So for example, uh, some of the topics include how to cultivate respect in a relationship, how to heal from a bad breakup step-by-step guides to help couples manage conflict, uh, how to affair-proof your relationship. Those are just a few of the topics that we talk about uh, in these free guides. So if any of those sound interesting to you, you can check those out on our website at idopodcast.com. We hope you guys enjoyed today's show. 